oh, man, we just have so many customers and people at events and people in our sessions and training classes. It's just one of the most popular questions that we get asked. And it's, you know, I do this job today, insert DBA, BI developer, analyst, um, you know, data developer, app developer, what have you, uh, architect especially. Uh, how is that changing my world? My company's doing more and more in the cloud. We've moved a few VMs. We're, we're trying to create a cloud data strategy or we acquired a company and we're moving to their cloud data strategy. Any, any way your company and your, you and your team get sort of involved in, in uh, working with data in the cloud? They said, you know, how, what do I need to know? How do I get ramped up? Where do I go for help? Uh, I just, it feels like a big thing. And wasn't the cloud supposed to, uh, you know, get rid of the DBA or, you know, certainly not from our perspective. Uh, wasn't the cloud supposed to take care of all the, the chores? Yeah, some of them, it absolutely takes care of some of them, but you got to know how to set it up so that it does that. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is this idea of becoming the ultimate cloud DBA. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this by saying most of you will not do everything in this presentation. And that's a good thing because we have a lot in here. It can be a little overwhelming to think about these are all of the different kinds of things cloud DBAs might need to learn or might need to deal with, might need to pay attention to. But I'm going to do my best to segment it a little bit for you. So these are the things that everybody kind of needs to know. And these are the things that folks who work more in a production environment need to know. If you're working with the infrastructure at all, you need to understand these types of things. If you're working with data warehouses or analytics or supporting Office 365 or Power BI, many of you wear multiple hats. And if you're doing those types of things, these are the other things you need to know. And so as we go through this, I've got about I don't know, 12 slides or so I'm gonna take you through, nothing crazy. And I'm gonna to try to make sure we leave time for q and I have an amazing uh, announcement at the end about an incredible resource that we're gonna make available for you guys. So please stay tuned um, as we get through to the end right before the Q&A. And then I'm happy to do as much Q&A uh, as we possibly have time for. And Crystal uh, is gonna help us out with that. So uh, as we get ready here and jump in, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what's changed and what I mean by that is you know how are your worlds changing what are we seeing changing and what does that mean for you and so what we're really going to go through today is uh, the types of skills that you need professionally development skills managing data, working with analytics platforms and other cloud integrated type of solutions, right? High availability, recovery, performance tuning, all those things. We're gonna talk about all that and I'll kind of give you a list in a minute. But the kinds of things that really have changed are the way that companies really think about and look at their data. So corporate IT strategy in general has changed. The fear about moving data and systems into the public cloud is largely gone. It's still there in pockets and some smaller organizations, some leadership teams who uh, maybe have been enrolled for a long time, people who maybe been burned by a poor cloud implementation. Uh, I see a lot of similarities to when we started doing data warehousing 13 years ago and people have said, oh, don't come in and talk about a data warehouse because we've done three of those and they were all terrible. And we said, well, maybe we just didn't do it the right way. And we need to do uh, we need to take a good look at what you need and then build what you need instead of just trying to build a thing, right? We don't want to go to the cloud. We want to take uh, the cloud and bring the parts of it that matter to you and to your business. Architectures have also changed. Uh, cost structures and financial management of technology, this idea of bulk investments every three to five years and significant depreciation and managing uh, you know, IT as basically a, a roll-off financial cost center. A lot of that has changed. The, the ability of the public cloud and pricing and, and um, uh, capacity and performance management uh, directly tying back to cost and to, uh, to billing and, and billing management allows, you know, small and large businesses to do things like streamline chargeback and automated chargeback integration and being able to uh, build an architecture that also includes who and how 
uh, will be paying for that architecture as part of the way it's deployed and rolled out, and that's pretty amazing. Um, we also get the ability to uh, give the business or the IT that's supporting the business a lot more control over scaling up and down performance through automation, uh, whether that's scheduled or on demand or auto scale. Uh, there's lots of capabilities now for us as professionals, data professionals, cloud professionals, to really bring uh, the solutions that we're building closer to the business, have us focus on the core pieces and let the business have flexibility where it makes sense for them to have flexibility without creating more heartburn uh, for us as professionals. Your roles and responsibilities are also changing. Uh, it, one of the things that we did sourcing the content for this uh, for this presentation was I went to our entire team here at Pragmatic Works and we had a brainstorming session and we got a ton of good ideas. So many things I couldn't put in the deck. I said, you guys know this is only a one hour webinar, but uh, we've pared it down, consolidated a few things to make it accessible for you. But you know, we talk to folks and they say, well, I'm a DBA slash this, I'm a developer slash this, I'm a development DBA, I'm a production DBA, I'm a cloud, uh, I'm a hybrid DBA. Everybody's roles are getting adjectives, whether it's a DBA role or a developer architect, whatever it is. Everybody's putting more and more adjectives. And that's great because it shows that roles are expanding, roles are evolving, and that's clarity. Um, but at the end of the day, this is this presentation is really focused on Folks who have to work with, manage, uh, and use data in the cloud and help companies drive their strategy, their implementation, their day-to-day -day tactics, um, those folks are going to get a lot from uh, this particular session. And we're going to do other ones for other types of uh, specialized roles as we go forward. There's another great session with Steve Hughes uh, who's that's coming up uh, here, I think, next week, actually. So make sure you sign up for that. It's going to go deeper into some of these things, more of the on-premise to cloud journey. Uh, so I think you guys are going to have a lot of uh, exciting things to get out of that. So to help me kind of get started as I talk through what we're going to do today, if you guys could do me a quick favor and help me understand uh, what percentage of data you guys are currently using in the cloud. I'm just going to launch a quick poll for you. Do me a favor, just give that a quick answer. Uh, and as you're doing that, I'll start to talk through all the things that, uh, that we're going to cover today. So I'll give you guys uh, just a couple minutes to do that. Uh, what we're going to talk through today is what does that ultimate cloud DBA playbook look like? And it's got a number of you know, different pieces. It's got things that are technical, so things that you just need to know how to go do. It's got kind of best practice patterns that you need to be familiar with. It's got uh, non-technical skills, what I will all call, just call professional skills for today. Things that you need to be good at with working with other people and, and you know, things around managing certain types of cloud projects and understanding the right processes and things like that, because things can work differently uh, in the cloud. And so we're gonna talk through a variety of technical components from development, analytics, scalability, integration and workflow, security and identity, Azure infrastructure, high availability and recovery that's just so, so important. And uh, then we'll get into things like performance tuning and I'm gonna give you some resources uh, at the end to make sure that you stay informed, that you stay up to date. And then we're gonna talk about, you know, where, where, do, we, uh, where do we go from here and how do we continue uh, to move forward? So I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll out. Let you guys uh, see some of the results. Looks like a pretty good balance between folks that are newer to the cloud, uh, a little bit of folks that kind of maybe have their first workload in, first or second workload in, uh, and then a handful of folks who uh, have not started that journey yet. So this is great. You guys are right uh, in the right ballpark uh, for this type of content. So fantastic. I, uh, I appreciate you guys helping me uh, learn a little bit more about you so I can talk about all the right things. So this is uh, kind of the list that we talked through before. We're gonna go through all of these different skills, talk about where to go from here, get you guys some resources. And so without any more uh, background, I'll jump into professional skills. And what we mean by professional skills are things like communicating with non-technical users. The, the cloud gives you the opportunity to work on lots of uh, projects that are more business integrated than ever before. And so you're gonna have to take the 
the incredible amount of smarts that you have uh, and be able to translate it into business outcomes or, or user outcomes, user stories, those kinds of things. The rate at which the cloud moves means you need to have an always learning attitude. If you're gonna work in an environment that's always uh, growing and always evolving, you wanna have an attitude that says, I'm gonna do the same thing. It's not like with SQL Server or Oracle from years past where we get a new version every four years and you'd ramp up kind of over two years and get, get used to it. You gotta be able to learn more quickly, which means you need resources, you need a guide, uh, you need to know where to find those Azure updates and changes. I've got those resources for you. Toward the end of the presentation, I'll make sure that you have those and that they're shared. You also want to understand uh, your pricing, managing your bill, uh, understanding uh, Azure features that are available. Uh, you also want to make sure that you kind of change your mindset uh, around designing solutions and building solutions. Uh, it's less about features and products in the cloud, and it's more about how do I move the data in and out? How do I manage it when it's at rest? How do I secure it at rest, rest and in, uh, in flight? And then how do I allow people to catalog, curate, share, collaborate, visualize that data? Uh, and then how do we maybe use it for more advanced analytics? And so rather than worrying about uh, what type of uh, solution you're going to build or which software product you're going to use. Should it be in SQL Server? Should it be in Oracle? Should it be a database or a data warehouse? You want to get familiar with all the different types of services, and we're going to talk through those. Uh, it's really important to be able to have that mindset shift as you go through it. Uh, last but not least, you want to understand how to do adoption and migration planning. You're talking about new things. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been involved in a project where you build a very cool thing and you release it, you push it out into the, the river of users, and they go, huh, all right, that's fine. And they go back to what they were using before. And that is, uh, I mean, one, it's just incredibly demoralizing. But two, it's bad for the company and it's bad for the users because you built this very cool thing for them. And so you want to understand best practices around getting adoption, doing migrations in a way that uh, you know, really show value quickly, get users on board, build momentum. Uh, all that kind of stuff is incredibly valuable. Uh, there, we had about 30 other professional skills that came up, uh, understanding agile project uh, management and deployment, understanding how to uh, manage cost from a, you know, a dev test and production perspective. Um, but all of these kind of fall up under these buckets. Next, we're going to talk about development skills. This was another place we, we kind of rolled a few things up, uh, but you won't be surprised that about half of these are things that you probably are familiar with now or, or are on your to-do list in a non-premise SQL Server world. Uh, T-SQL, Management Studio, PowerShell, Python. Uh, Scala is uh, seeing a little bit more um, adoption than R. We see more customers using Scala. Uh, for certain types of workloads. Uh, file types, we talk about moving data in and out of Azure in between services. Uh, JSON, just as a, as a file, not only a file type, but just a, a data storage format and parquet files are very important. DAX and M, if you're working with anything within Power BI or the analytics components around Power BI. Uh, also, just understanding how to move data around in the cloud. That could be moving data in and out of storage, whether it's tables, uh, blob storage, et cetera. That could be using something like Azure Data Factory to move and create data pipelines. We'll hear more about Azure Data Factory in a minute. Uh, it could also mean using your existing ETL tools like SSIS and Informatica to connect up to Azure services uh, and move data not only into the cloud, but in and out uh, and around when it's already up there. Uh, one of the things to remember is you pay for data when you move it out, you pay for egress. and so. We try really hard not to egress uh, when we don't have to. So that's another kind of cost factor that comes into play when you're looking at development. Uh, things like Azure Notebooks and Jupyter Notebooks for data analysis and presentation. If you haven't played with notebooks, these are the coolest things. I used to have to write stored procedures and gather data and put it in Excel and you know try to shift it around and export it to PowerPoint and oh, it was a nightmare. Now, with the notebooks, we can run queries, do analysis all in line. We can put comments and analysis and graphics and tell an entire story uh, that not only helps us do repeat analysis and, and evolve the way we look at our data, 
but it helps us communicate that in a really clear way that, that other users can then go test and reproduce. It's very cool. Uh, application architecture fundamentals in the cloud. What does that mean? It means designing for scalability, elasticity. It means designing for potential connectivity drops because you may or may not always have internet. Uh, so you wanna be able to uh, function with the types of benefits and restrictions that actually exist in the cloud. Source control, hugely important. I can't tell you how many data folks I talk to and they're like, oh, source control's in the database. I back up my database every day. So if I ever need anything, I just restore it and go get what I need. I gotta be honest, that makes me break out in hives a little bit. I don't, I don't like that answer. Um, this is one of the biggest things from my team. So you wanna use something like a GitHub, something like uh, Visual Studio Team, uh, something like Azure DevOps, uh, just to manage your process and your source control pick one, it doesn't matter which one, just get familiar with it. Um, get familiar with the one that your company uses. If you don't have one, figure out how to begin to integrate into it, especially with Azure. You're gonna see a lot more sort of CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous development, uh, DevOps style, um, development and deployments, which we'll talk about um, as the very next bullet. Uh, deployment and migration management. How do you manage deployments? How do you manage code migrations from dev the test, QA, prod, uh, do you run just a prod uh, that you design to always be up? Do you run a prod with a separate DR? How are those kinds of things going to be managed and how are you gonna handle deployments uh, in those types of scenarios? So lots of interesting development skills. I could have done an entire presentation for two hours just on things you could learn to develop in the cloud. This is really focused on those of us who are gonna see these types of things uh, from a DBA's perspective. Make sense? All right, let's talk about where the data goes. Where does the data go when it goes to the cloud? We put our data, I'm making air quotes, but you can't see them, we put our data in the cloud. Uh, every time I hear that phrase, I think about that movie, um, The Internship with Vince Vaughn, where, he's, where he does the exchange-a-gram. Uh, we're gonna put it on the line. Uh, I just love, I love that part of that movie. It cracks me up all the time. So anyway, enough, enough sidetrack to my, my movie, uh, my movie quotes. Uh, data storage and management. You got to know where to put the data based on what you're going to do with it. That's it. This is a list of stuff that's important, but there's different reasons to use each one based on your workload. Azure SQL database or Azure SQL DB gives you a fully PaaS offering. It's very scalable, that gives you lots of redundancy options, uh, pretty much full compatibility. SQL on IaaS is typically used for, hey, we just gotta get these VMs of SQL on and moved up to the cloud and then we'll refactor later. Um, that's a great way to just get things into the cloud quickly, uh, but you wanna make sure you know how to manage VMs and do security around VMs and the infrastructure in the cloud. Managed instance brings a more fully managed instance as a service. So things like jobs and cross database and some of those things that, you know, we know are, are you know, they're there, they're a fact of life and they can slow down migrations and they can require refactoring. Well, we don't necessarily need to do that. Managed instance is a little more expensive. You get more features, you move it up and then you take the stuff that doesn't need to be on there uh, and go ahead and refactor it off so you can keep your momentum. Uh, Azure Data Warehouse, hands down, Best data warehouse in the cloud. Um, we're not biased, we've tried them all. Uh, if there was a better one, that's what we would deploy. Um, incredibly scalable, we have a ton of customers who move from compete platforms over to building things in Azure Data Warehouse, but you wanna understand what those design best practices are based on the platform that you're using. Uh, something like SQL on IaaS, you're not really gonna have to worry about too much other than the VM capacity. But Azure Data Warehouse, you have data partitioning, you have a key structure you wanna make sure you design correctly, you have you know, a query optimization best practices. So there's lots of you know, little tips and tricks that can help you uh, really do some incredible work there. Uh, we've got some great videos on our YouTube channel about doing things in Azure Data Warehouse as well as across Azure SQL. Uh, Cosmos DB, incredible global scale uh, data storage uh, and database can, it's multi-model. Uh, allows you to do some really incredible things. If you're looking, we use it a lot for log analytics. If you're just looking to dump log data into a, a queryable uh, or graph style database, Cosmos DB is really great for that. Um, Azure Data Lake Storage, we use this a lot with Power BI. So we see uh, customers who, you know, they don't need a data warehouse. They just need a great place to put and organize their data. They're gonna build their models in Power BI. 
Uh, Azure Data Lake Storage is a great cost-effective, high-performing uh, sort of multi-tier storage you can put behind your Power BI implementation. So you may have customers or, or um, folks from your business that come in and say, hey, we're trying to grow our Power BI, but we're running our space in Power BI. I need to put this in a database because that's all they know. Don't just immediately put that in a database. Think about uh, what a database would cost. Somebody's got to manage it. Somebody's got to back it up. Somebody's got to design it. Uh, when we could just put that uh, that data in Azure Data Lake storage. Uh, also, Polybase, being able to use Polybase, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, to connect to Azure Data Warehouse or other storage uh, facilities. Uh, Polybase allows that bridge between uh, the less structured data and your fully structured data, uh, which gives you a lot of, dis of additional capability, faster ingestion, uh, more data uh, availability, uh, especially when you're looking at bringing data in from multiple sources. Uh, last but not least, think about how you're going to do data governance and compliance. The Microsoft Trust and Compliance Center in Azure, there's a great resource there. It talks through if you have regulatory, you know, um, specific like SOX requirements or other regulatory requirements, they walk through some best practices, give you a head start. If you don't have a specific regulatory concern, you can look up, are you concerned about sort of security, uh, unauthorized access, uh, you know, external access, any of those kinds of things. There's some great resources on that. I'll share those with you toward the end. Uh, storage accounts, last but not least, we've, we're not only necessarily just gonna put data into a service, we gotta store it somewhere. So that VM that your SQL is on, it's got, it's got a storage account. It's got storage behind it. Um, the Azure Data Warehouse is it decoupled uh, compute and storage, which makes it, is part of what makes it so powerful. Uh, Azure Data Lake Storage, storage is in the name. Uh, it's basically managed storage with some uh, some additional capability. So you really want to understand, should I be using queues or tables or blob storage? Should I be using managed storage or which performance level of storage? Read up on the storage. You, I would have always thought storage kind of boring, right? My whole career storage was, you know, the SAN, then we got flash SANs. Uh, then we got hybrid stuff that would burst to the cloud or burst to the, another data center. Um, and then all of a sudden in the cloud, we have all these different kinds of storage that are really tailored to the type of data and the type of workload uh, that you want to drive. So that's, you know, that's very, very cool. It's not just, hey, I've, I've got a hard drive in the cloud, right? Um, we're going to move on to uh, analytics platforms. So this will be kind of specifically for folks that are probably going to have to get involved once your IT department or your business starts saying, hey, we got all this data that we've stored in one of these great places. Where, how are we going to analyze it? <laughs> what We're going to put up this type of solution and you're going to want to know what that uh, vocabulary is. You're going to want to know what, what that means. And so we're going to talk through it. Um, but as we look ahead, as you guys are looking at moving your data uh, into the cloud, uh, let's do me a favor. Help me understand because I'm, I'm the next couple of slides are really going to focus on as we move forward into the cloud. It would really help me if you guys could just give me a sense of uh, where, how much you think you're going to go into the cloud. How much of your data do you think you're going to move in the next, um, you know, 12 months or so? What are you thinking about uh, as you move through the through the next year? Um, oh, great! Yeah, I already see uh, see some uh, uh, see some good movement there. Um, we have so many customers that are moving those first, second, third workloads up. Uh, and it's just a really exciting time to be working with those customers because for me, it's really exciting to work with you because I get to talk to the teams. I get to understand, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? Where are they trying to go? Um, the rest of it's just technology, right? We're all smart people. You guys are certainly smart enough to handle all the technology changes if you have the right plan. So. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, sharing some of that with me. Uh, it doesn't look like it's moving anymore. You guys did a great job. So I'm going to just close it and share it so you can see kind of where you are. So we've got um, about maybe half of you looking to move about 25 to 75%, a little bit more. A few more of you not, not moving yet, still trying to get ready. That makes sense. That's great. Thank you very much for, uh, for sharing that with me. So as we look at the analytics platform. There's a few key things. Now, there are so many analytics services uh, in the Azure cloud. Uh, there just are. But these are the ones in the areas that we see 
uh, DBAs and data pros getting pulled in on the most. So Azure Analysis Services is Analysis Services uh, as a PaaS service in the cloud. Excuse me for that. I drink some water. I can't lose my voice in the middle of the webinar. We also have uh, Databricks integrations. So Databricks is an incredibly powerful, scalable platform. Uh, we partner with Databricks on a lot of engagements. Uh, they have everything from uh, data, man uh, data management, ETL, analytics, notebooks, things like that. They support a, a huge amount of functionality, uh, all delivered natively in Azure as a service. Azure Machine Learning, you don't have to know how to go build machine learning models, but you do know, you do need to know where is that data stored? How is it processed? Am I running machine learning inside SQL in an IaaS VM? If I am, it's probably a good idea uh, to make sure that VM has some extra horsepower because that's a pretty memory intensive operation, just like it would be on premise. That's not anything new for, for most of you who are DBAs today. Cognitive services, you're probably thinking, man, we're barely in the cloud. We're not. We're not going to do AI yet, right? I would say about 20% of our customers are piloting an AI solution right now. We have about 4,000 customers. So, um, you know, what is that? About 800 customers, give or take, based on our latest survey results. So that doesn't mean it's all going to production tomorrow. But what it does mean is, especially in certain industries, retail, e-com, things like that, where uh, simple AI solutions like chatbots, uh, customer experience, uh kind of interactive experiences things like that they're not hard to build matter of fact you can get them built in a matter of a couple of weeks and get them tested and get them released but they need data and they're going to need you to help them make that data available and so you're going to want to know what are they trying to do with that data are they querying it or are they just loading it into a model how do they want to move that data around in azure now you're starting to see the tie back to the fundamentals, the first development skills piece. All of these basically come down to how is the data moving? Where is it coming from? So our, our data storage and management, and where is it going to? Something like analysis services, it's gonna go there and a copy of it's gonna stay there. Something like Azure Machine Learning or Cognitive Services, it's just gonna go be available to that service, be processed and then go away and, and stay back where it originally was. And then if you're looking at things like Power BI, uh, Power Query being the main uh, ingestion process for Power BI, you're going to need to be able to tell people where data is, how you're storing it. Uh, if they're going to be doing a lot of querying with Power Query, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, that the data is available for querying, that it's not on cold storage or archive storage somewhere, that it's, that it's actually available. And last but not least, there are a number of new data flow features in Azure for uh, moving and managing data, not just in Power BI, but also in Azure Data Factory. Uh, and again, you're hearing from our team here and a bunch of Microsoft MVPs, whose input I also got for this uh, presentation, that managing the way that data is stored, the way that it moves, and the way that uh, services connect to each other is some of the most important things that you can test and, and understand on your own. And the good news about that the reason that can feel like a big problem, right? That can be like, oh my God, there's like a hundred services. And how do I test this and how do I learn it? It's super easy, guys. Get a CSV file or a little bit of data and just move it around. Just set up little tests. I want to go from SQL DB to Power Query. I want to go from Cosmos DB to, um, to Azure Blob Storage. And from Blob Storage, I want to go to Azure Data Lake Storage, right? How do I move these things around? Uh, it costs nothing if you're using a small file. The things that work for small files work for big files. Uh, there's some different patterns that you run when you're really using data at scale. But if you're just trying to get familiar with it, use a small amount of data, spin up a free account, uh, and go to town and have some fun. Speaking of scale and scalability, this is something you really want to understand as you get past that first workload. Uh, managing things like auto scale, automating your scale with PowerShell. So uh, just last week, we, we helped one of our customers go from running their dev test environment full time. We saved them, I don't know, like a million dollars a year, truly about a million dollars a year by just automating the spin down of that uh, overnight. And that took about, I don't know, a day and a half of some PowerShell development, just customizing some scripts that we have to work with their environment. 
And so now after 10 p.m., their dev environment spins down. Of course, if a developer needs it, they can always spin it back up, but 90% of the time they don't need it. Uh, and that's really saved them a lot of money. Uh, and then last, we got to manage the elasticity of the architecture. So not only can we spin it down, but can we spin it up, right? So at month end, do we need to spin it up? Do we have a peak time for the website during the day? Do we need to you know, pre-spin uh, up, uh, whether it's more VMs in a scale set, whether it's um, uh, increasing the size footprint of the SQL DB or data warehouse or the deployment size of Cosmos DB or increasing the uh, performance level of certain storage, we can mix and match kind of constantly in Azure. And that's one of the things that's so cool. Whatever you start with is not what you're stuck with all the time. You can start with something small, grow into what you need, and then adapt it on the fly, even throughout the day, uh, based on how your business needs to run, which uh, to me is just, it's just so cool. Coming from a, a, you know, a time when we couldn't do that, it's just incredibly cool. Integration and workflow management. So here's where we get to uh, making services work together and uh, managing the workflow of not only data, but just the process of your application. So things like logic apps, which allow us uh, a lot of different integration points, Azure Data Factory, of course, which is sort of a orchestration uh, slash ETL tool for, for Azure. Uh, data loading patterns, do we scale out loading? Do we load it to blob storage first and then kind of CTAS or create a uh, table as select into something like Azure Data Warehouse? Uh, we need to understand CI/CD with uh, Azure DevOps. So how do we manage a kind of DevOps pipeline and handle DevOps task management and integrate it into our project management uh, to make sure that, you know, everybody's aligned and that we're doing the right things. And then making sure that we know how to connect services together. So how does Azure Data Factory work with data lake storage and Azure Data Warehouse and how does it actually make those connections? Are there limits or uh, best practices to using those connections? Uh, using APIs in Azure, lots of things in Azure are accessible, uh, not only in the GUI, but also via PowerShell, also via Linux shell, also via API. And a lot of times, if you're building internal applications uh, or logic apps or other things to uh, manage and automate your environment, APIs are a great option, and a lot of companies use the heck out of them. Last but not least, uh, we, uh, some of you might be in an industry where you process a lot of events. We have, uh, man, this is everything from telemetry data, manufacturing data, smart grid data. We have a, a number of big energy and oil and gas companies that use Azure event tools, whether it's Event Hub, Event Grid. Um, and again, not only bringing that data in, but how to process it using those uh event tools how to store it where do you want to store it are you going to need to access it later um, most folks are not processing millions of events a day and then paying to put those in a data warehouse uh, one because the events can change shape over time and two the storage for a data warehouse is is more expensive than just storage and so a lot of times they use things like azure data lake store they might use cosmos db we use cosmos db a lot for log events and telemetry for large global azure systems and so this is another great thing to go, you know, take a couple hours over maybe a long lunch break one day, order yourself a sub, uh, and then build out a little pilot, uh, build out a little working pilot where you spit some events in maybe from PowerShell and, uh, you know, get it up and working and, you know, showcase, uh, you know, kind of where it's going and get an understanding of the functionality. It's pretty cool stuff. Now, this is one of the big ones, security and identity management. So around security, you may not have to worry about this at all. This is one of those things where it may or may not be part of your role. You may have a networking and infrastructure team, and as long as you've secured the data or the database that you're talking about, you don't have to worry about the rest. But these are things that you're going to wind up in conversations about. Azure Active Directory possibly Office 365 and Power BI tenant management. Who is the admin? What does the admin uh, need to be able to do? There are certain things that are very helpful that you actually have to be an Office 365 global admin in order to be able to do, um, like pull data uh, from a Dynamics implementation uh, at a certain level and other things like that, right? So there's just, there's some idiosyncrasies around some of that stuff that again, you wanna test out and make sure you know how to do. Uh, understanding the threat protection features in Microsoft, uh, in Microsoft Azure, excuse me. There are lots of different threat protection, both for your database, there's denial of service protection, there's 
uh, you know, sort of site level threat protection, all just based on what you want to pay. And then understanding roles in Azure, not your role, but the actual security roles, contributor, um, owner, administrator, what are these different roles? What do they allow? Making sure that you understand them because they don't necessarily map directly uh, back to what we know from an on-premise world. They sort of mean the same thing. There's, there's parallels, but they're not exactly the same. And you're going to want to make sure that you understand what those are. For those of you who have some hand in the infrastructure, you want to understand network security, network security groups. That's what I mean by NSG, firewalls, port management, all that kind of good stuff. It's not that hard. Uh, it works very much like it does uh, on premises, but uh, you do need to understand how you can wall off different parts uh, of your infrastructure. You want to understand how to do log management and analytics. We do a lot of that with all of our solutions and it's really incredibly valuable. Monitoring and alerting automation. How do you make sure you know when something's wrong? One of the best quotes from somebody on our team, one of our architects, they said, I really think the most important thing is that somebody can open up Azure and immediately go, is everything okay? <laughs> is everything working okay? How do I know that? How do I make sure I'm getting alerts at the right times? Uh, all of that stuff is super important. And again, a lot of that is gonna be done through PowerShell and through some automation in the, uh, uh, in the Azure portal. You also need to understand multi-cloud architecture. So uh, multi-cloud architecture uh, is super important. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I actually have a uh, last last question for you guys, I promise. And I know, uh, I know I'm know i bugging you with questions today, but it really helps me. Multi-cloud architecture is really important. Most of our customers have something in at least two clouds, uh, usually Azure and AWS. Uh, and managing capacity and connectivity between the two of those, understanding how resource management and organization uh, is the same and different, understanding what tools you can use uh, to, you know, really drive, uh, you know, the management of those solutions. Uh, being able to do it across cloud is super important. We do uh, most of the Azure work here. Um, but we still need to be able to work and design things to work with customer architectures. And that's, uh, that's really important. So uh, last but not least, you need to understand your governance strategy. So governance is a big word. There's whole departments around it. But really what we mean about this here is how do you make sure people don't have access to stuff they're not supposed to have access to? <laughs> so that could be uh, making sure that your network security and your resource grouping is set up correctly. Uh, it could even just be that you have monitoring set up when people uh, request access or do those kinds of things. And so thank you all for, uh, for working on that, uh, that question for me. I really appreciate that. And so once our infrastructure is in good place and we looked at our governance, uh, one of the things that's really important is can we stay up? And if we go down for whatever reason, how fast can we get back? Or if we screw something up, can we get it back to 2 p.m. yesterday or 30 minutes ago or whatever that is? High availability and disaster recovery, you don't need me to preach to you about how important this is if you've watched the news at all in the last six months. But you need to be able to manage backups and test recovery. But Adam, I thought Azure took care of all that for us. It can, but you got to set it up right. It's got to be set up correctly, and it doesn't test it for you. You need to be able to still test it and validate. The good news is you can automate all of that. Uh, and so it can run every night, every Tuesday night, every Thursday, every Friday, every Sunday at 4 a.m., however you want that to work, but it's still got to be done. You got to be able to prove that it's working. You need to understand regional data architectures. You need to be able to understand, hey, some of my data is originating in Europe, but my architecture means all my data is going to be stored in East U.S. Uh, that could be a legal problem. Germany doesn't really want me to take my data out of Germany uh, or at the very least out of the EU. And so there's, there's limitations on where data can be and how services can work together. Now, the good thing about Azure is when you move data across regions, that increases your costs, obviously, because they have to pay to move the data. And so there's lots of ways to design architecture so that the data stays where it starts and is used where it starts. And so you don't have to move it all around to lots of different places. You wanna understand data replication as part of that, right? Different uh, services and storage accounts have different levels of sort of geo replication across geographies versus just local replication. Uh, and for larger scale replication, we really love Azure Site Recovery. That's been a great 
uh, a great service for us being able to kind of integrate lots of different components into one recovery plan. So you really want to take a look and understand what these different features really would mean for you. If you were going to prioritize one, I would start with managing backups and testing recovery and then take a look at your regional data architectures and, and everything else. All right, we're getting down to the end, getting close. Uh, performance tuning, last but certainly not least. Uh, this is not last because it doesn't matter. It's just last because it's the one most of you are pretty familiar with. Uh, all of the things on this slide, you're probably reading this and going, well, duh, that's not new. And you're right, it's really not. You still have to partition your data the right way. You still have to index uh in the right way for the right type of data and query patterns that you want you do want to take a look at query patterns uh and their effect on performance which you do now but also price and cost if you have these really long running queries you could be uh using more resources or acquiring a larger instance of a particular service which could be costing you a lot uh 10 db performance and query design but last but not least the monitoring of the performance of your solution. And so one of the things that we recommend is a lot of alerting around uh, thresholds, around performance. And there's a number of different patterns and ways that you can do that, whether it's a third-party product, one of the enterprise monitoring suites, uh, you can roll your own uh, pretty easily for some basic monitoring to figure out which are the pieces that actually matter. So performance tuning has not gone away. I'm sure that's not a shock to any of you. Um, but as, uh, as part of that process, uh, you do need to understand how traditional performance tuning also affects uh, your cost, your pricing, uh, your response time for your end users, and most importantly, how to monitor it. There are some great monitoring solutions that will work across both clouds. I see about 25% uh, of you at least are in both clouds on this call. Normally, that number is closer to 50 to 60 uh, percent, uh, depending upon the audience that we have for the day. And so, uh, you know, we just basically estimate about half to 60 percent of our customers are multi-cloud. And so when we look at a solution, um, we have a lot of our customers who pull all of their data from both clouds into, you know, one cloud, normally Azure, into Azure Data Lake Storage. They dump all their log analytics in there or into Cosmos DB uh, because it's a lot, um, uh, their Power BI is already all integrated. Uh, and they do all the reporting and alerting with Power BI, so they have mobile and everything else, right? So there's some very, uh, very cool ability to do that, but you don't have to do that. You can get a monitoring tool that does both. Resources. Uh, there are tons of resources. These are the ones that you know we typically recommend to customers, and uh, that's how I look at all of you as customers and partners. And so docs.microsoft.com. I don't know if any of you have been doing this long enough to remember when Microsoft documentation was terrible but docs.microsoft.com is so much better uh the writers the folks working on this stuff the integration to the engineering teams it's really really good and there's lots of good resources out there uh of course pragmatic works youtube we have hundreds and hundreds of azure videos uh they're like five minutes long they're super targeted they're great options for you to get out there and you know pick something up uh, just get familiar with the topic quickly google and bing are your friends uh also ask Jeeves, is that still around? No, we're not gonna ask Jeeves. Just Google or Bing something. Bing is actually great for, for uh, looking through docs.microsoft.com. I know Bing gets, doesn't always get the love, um, but it, it indexes Microsoft sites better than any other search engine, which you, know, you kind of expect. Stack Overflow, always a great place. Other you know, community forum sites, um, as well as uh, our, our everyday series on Azure, Azure Everyday. There's some great Azure hands-on labs. If you just type into Bing Microsoft Azure hands-on labs, it will take you directly to uh, some great hands-on step-by-step labs that cover lots of different things on Azure. And then there's the Azure Data Architecture Guide. We contributed to this guide. Uh, it's freely available from Microsoft. Again, punch it in the search engine and, uh, and you'll find it there pretty quickly. Um, but it walks through different data patterns, loading, ingestion, a lot of the things that we talked about today. And it'll give you that first pass of, hey, this is what that pattern could look like. This is what it looks like at scale. Uh, this is maybe why you should pick different types of storage and, and that type of thing. So some really uh, highly targeted resources. I, I don't want to give you too many because then you'll just, it's easy to kind of have too many options, right? 
Uh, there's some great Microsoft, some great third parties, some great pragmatic work stuff. But the best is yet to come. And this is the last thing I want to talk about before we do Q&A. So uh, if you follow us at all, I'm sure you've heard about Azure Data Week. This happened last year. We're doing it again this year. It's October 7th to 10th. This event is crazy. It is awesome. It's the number one online Azure Data event in the world. It's 100% online. You get access to all the recordings for one year, uh, as much as you want. Every day, we're going to cover a different topic. We're going to cover a bunch of fundamentals topics, get you started, uh, migrations, how to move things to Azure, analytics, how to build data warehouse, BI analytics solutions in Azure, DevOps, how to manage your cloud with kind of uh, cloud DevOps, uh, data ops in Azure. Just really, really cool stuff. It's Pragmatic Works experts, Microsoft experts coming together to give you the latest and the greatest. We're going to do about eight sessions a day. They're about 45 minutes each to allow time for questions and for you to go to the other session. Uh, but the best thing is <clears throat> it's all live. So you get live Q&A with the speakers. You get to connect with them after the fact. Uh, tons of extra bonus content. We've got lots of you know, cheat sheets and uh, extra content that's coming out as part of the event. Uh, and then you even get access to a number of our free training classes after the event just for attending. So we added it up the other day. It's something like, I don't know, three, four thousand dollars in value. Uh, and we're only charging forty nine dollars. Our goal is not to make a trillion dollars off the event. We want to get you to the event. We want to interact with you. We want to understand uh, and help you. Right. We're just here to help the community, just like we do with these webinars. Uh, our goal is to get you connected with some great people uh, in the community at Microsoft and on our team to just help you unblock and accelerate what you're doing with Azure. So. I would highly recommend go out and check out azuredataweek.com. You can register right there. Register today. It's $49. I know I'm giving you the hard sales pitch here at the end, but that's okay because I totally believe in this thing. Uh, we had thousands of people come last year. Uh, they had a great experience. There's amazing quotes from them on our website. Just a, just a ton of value. So go check it out, and I promise you will not uh, be sorry. You're going to love it. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, we're going to go to Q&A, but uh, what I want to tell you before we go to Q&A is really my challenge to you is to think about if you're not in the, if you're not really working in the cloud yet and a part of your business is, go understand what they're doing. Go learn about it. Maybe try to get on that team. If you are working in the cloud and it's just a little bit, think about what's holding you back. Is it confidence? Is it not understanding? Um, you know, the, the right architecture? Is it your ability to kind of learn and lead, which of course, you know, can be challenging. You're already working 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week. When, when do I have time to learn the new thing and keep going? Um, that's a great time to call us, honestly. I mean, not to, not to do another pitch, um, but we're, we've got lots of ways we can plug in part-time and things like that to help you out and just continue to make you the, the rock star that you want to be. So my challenge to you is keep learning keep trying things stop reading after a while and just go put your hands on the keyboard uh, and build something you'll be amazed at how quickly you can become the ultimate version of yourself uh, in the cloud whatever that means for you so uh, with that let's uh, let's do q a crystal you ready for q a i am all right let's see what we got I don't see too many on my side. I see some when I had to run to a meeting. So let's, I think let's just give some people some time to answer some questions. Yeah, throw, throw those questions in, gang. Throw them in there and we'll, uh, we'll get them answered. We got a few minutes here. I can't believe I finished with 10 minutes to go. I never do that. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always like, we're going to have so much time for questions. And then I'm like, we have, Two minutes for questions. That's, that's it. So. Yeah, we'll give some people some minutes to type some questions in. No worries. No worries. And if you guys have questions and you know you don't want to do them on the webinar, you can always email me, ajorgensen at pragmaticworks.com. Uh, I will get you an answer. I'll get you to somebody who knows the answer if I don't. So.
Um, I think I see one in here. It says, are there any suggested architect patterns that you can share for data warehouse on Azure? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, um, we, I, I honestly don't have time to go into it on this call, but there's, uh, I know we have several other webinars in Azure Everyday videos on designing a data warehouse in Azure. The biggest thing that you want to understand is if you're moving an existing data warehouse, or if you are building a new data warehouse, if you're moving an existing data warehouse, you may, you're going to need to look at how do the queries I'm running align with how I want to partition that data to take advantage of all the uh, performance opportunities that I have in Azure. Uh, you also want to look at, do I need all of that data in the data warehouse, or can I put some of it in maybe Azure Data Lake Storage uh, and query it with Polybase, with like an extended table. Uh, so there's lots of um, potential, uh, you know, options when you're looking at sort of best practice architecture. It also depends on the size of the data warehouse. If it's kind of under a couple terabytes, we, you know, we don't, and it's not expected to grow a lot, we don't need to take as much advantage of some of the scale. If it's gonna be like four or five terabytes and get bigger and bigger, then we definitely wanna make sure that it's designed for maximum scale from the start. Don't put data in there that doesn't absolutely have to be in there um, and make sure it's working with a couple of services, right? A, a, a quote unquote data warehouse in Azure is usually a multi-service uh, implementation between Azure Data Warehouse, Data Factory and Data Lake Storage. Um, I see another one here from Linda about, uh, I'm new in Azure, thinking of taking some certifications. Where can I start? That is a great question, Linda. Uh, I would start with the Azure 900. Uh, it's an Azure Fundamentals exam. There's some great uh, prep courses online. Uh, it's kind of covers the, the breadth of Azure, uh, a little bit about all the services. So it's a great fundamental way to get started. And then if you want to do more uh, data work or infrastructure work or network uh, work, depending upon where your background is and where you're going. Uh, there are specialty certifications for all those things that you can find out about at Microsoft Learning. It's a great way, a great place to go. Uh, Jamie, I see you want to copy the resource list. Uh, we'll have the deck published and everything on the blog uh, within a day or so, so you can get a copy of all that uh, probably by tomorrow. Just keep an eye on our social and we'll post it. Any, uh, anybody else? Uh, let's see, there is another one. Can I get a copy of the resources list from Jamie? Yeah, I, yeah I, just, I think I just said, Jamie, if you need the resources list, um, it'll all be posted uh, when the webinar goes live. So you can get it there, right on, right on our blog. Looks like that's about it. I think there's one more. Um, I am new in Azure and thinking of taking some certifications. Where can I start? Yeah, I think your audio dropped out, Chris, because I just answered that. Oh. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yeah, no, it's good though. It's it's a good question. So again, Azure 900, start with that fundamental certification. And then uh, there's lots of Azure certifications depending upon sort of which specialty area you want to go into. Well, that looks like that's the last one on my side. I don't see any more after that. No, nope, I don't see any more either. Well, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate everybody showing up. Thanks for answering some questions and helping me out a little. And um, we don't forget to register for, uh, go out, check out azuredataweek.com. Don't forget to register for that uh, today before we sell out. Um, we are really uh, trying to make sure that all of our uh, existing audience gets first dibs. So you guys get in there, get that registration done. Uh, and you'll get all the details via email. It's going to be amazing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Adam, for hosting. We really appreciate it. And like Adam had already stated, all of our webinars are now on YouTube, so you guys can explore the old ones. You can explore the present ones, whichever ones you guys are filling up to. You can do that. And yes, this is recorded. You guys will receive an email link tomorrow in your email. So probably about around noon or so, you guys should have that email to this recording. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or Adam. And like he said, please check out Azure Data Week. It's going to be great, great, great stuff. I start in October 7th. So you guys, please, please, please look out for that. Um, and like I said before, thank you so much, Adam, for hosting. And thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. -bye.